The first point I'd like to make is that uh, this is a very difficult problem and uh, hazards presented by the faulty airbag inflators are very serious, potentially causing death. And the fact that uh, the hazard presented by faulty Takata airbags can cause serious injury and death, coupled with the fact that um, the consumer cannot visually see their inflator, um, therefore, and they're therefore completely unaware of the imminent danger, was what prompted uh, government response. Um, all of the industry, to varying degrees, uh, are required to address this problem. And uh, while the recall notices place, sorry, the recall notice places the onus largely on manufacturers to replace affected airbag inflators, uh, we acknowledge the impact um, that uh, this recall notice has on the wider industry, and that's what we're here for uh, to discuss and clarify for you today. So, in this presentation, uh, we're going to cover a lot of ground. First, we're going to look at uh, the Takata airbag problem and uh, have uh, identified the nature of the defect and the risk that the airbags pose to drivers. We're then going to speak about the government's response to the problem, and that is the recall notice. And we're also going to spend some time explaining the operation of the recall notice, uh, including the obligations it places on suppliers, suppliers as defined in the notice. Um, and under the notice, suppliers are vehicle manufacturers and other businesses that import and supply vehicles from overseas. Uh, the fourth point we'll cover is um, where dealers and other industry who do not fit the definition of supplier under the notice, where these um, parts of industry uh, fit under the recall notice. And they're, um, for example, dealers, second-hand dealers, recyclers. We also discuss some Australian consumer law issues that arise from the Takata problem and cover next steps for the ACCC and we're happy to answer questions. So, the problem, how did we get here? Well, globally, uh, the Takata recall is the largest and most complex uh, automotive recall in history. An estimated 100, vehicle, 100 million vehicles are affected worldwide, with about 4 million vehicles in Australia uh, affected in total. Um, again, the Takata airbags, as we all know, have the potential to kill or seriously injure people. And the phrase ticking time bomb essentially conveys the lethal uh, potential of these defective inflators. Um, stats are, uh, are growing. We've, we're using some dated stats in this presentation. Already they've, um, uh, yes, okay, 24 reported deaths, 230 injuries, and we know of more injuries. We just haven't had a chance to update the presentation. Uh, what's the problem? What's the root cause? Well, the answer to the root cause is that um, Frontal Takata airbag inflators that use phased stabilised ammonium nitrate, or PSAN, um, propellant, uh, and those that either do not have a desiccant or have a calcium sulphate desiccant are, um, are, the, are the problem, and under the notice they're, uh, they're termed affected Takata airbag inflators. So in a nutshell, the design of the affected Takata airbag inflator allows moist air to intrude. Um, the PSAN degrades over time um, with the exposure to the moist air and temperature cycling. Um, when this happens, the PSAN burns more rapidly than it's designed to, uh, and this increases the, um, the burning and generates excessive gas, causing overpressurisation, and the inflator, inflator housing um, during airbag deployment actually potentially explodes, shooting the shrapnel um, towards, projecting it towards the occupants of the vehicle. Uh, in Australia, we've uh, had uh, one death and one serious injury reported. Um, in separate rupture events involving Takata airbags. Uh, on the 24th of April, there was a 21-year-old woman in Darwin who obtained a serious uh, eye and head injury. And on the 13th of July last year, sorry, um, a 58-year-old Sydney man uh, died in his, uh, when his uh, 2000, 2007 Honda CRV uh, airbag uh, ex uh, exploded in an accident, in a, in a um, slow-moving accident. Um, in terms of uh, what the government's doing, and we'll talk more about this uh, in detail as we go along, um, in mid-2017, the ACCC established the task force uh, to conduct the safety investigation. Uh, in August, the Minister issued a safety warning notice. October, we conducted uh, consultation with the industry. And on the 27th of February, following the um, recommendation by the ACCC, um, the Minister in implemented the recall notice. So. Now I'm actually going to hand over to John, who's going to take us through the requirements of the notice. And this is a really detailed presentation, so um, I, there will be question, time for questions after, and you'll no doubt want to, more information as John goes along. But we're going to cover um, 
basically all sectors of the market and how the, uh, how the recall notice flows through the industry. Before I launch into the discussing the recall notice, um, I need to start, as all good lawyers do, uh, with a disclaimer. And that's that while I am an external lawyer, um, I'm presenting today in my capacity as a member of the um, ACCC's Decatur Task Force. So um, nothing I say should be construed as independent legal advice. Um, if you have any concerns about the legal application of this notice, um, then you should consider seeking your own legal advice. So I've said that. Um, moving on with the presentation. Um, slide. Um, what's the purpose of this recall notice? It, it serves a very important purpose, and that's to protect the safety of Australian consumers. Um, we have no doubt that it will save lives. It, it may have already saved lives. It serves this purpose by requiring suppliers of vehicles equipped with um, affected Takata airbag inflators uh, to recall those vehicles and replace the inflators. Under the recall notice, suppliers will be required to account for 100% of affected um, Takata inflators, uh, and that includes those that are in salvage yards. Um, the recall notice will ensure that there is a greater level of consistency across suppliers' recall activity. Um, of course, the most obvious example of this is that some suppliers who did not voluntary, voluntarily recall affected vehicles um, have been forced to do this under the recall notice. So there were some who, who had voluntarily recalled. There were some that were doing a pretty good job of, under their voluntary recall. There were some who weren't doing a very good job under their voluntary recall but were voluntarily recalling. And then there were those who were supplying vehicles with affected Takata inflators who weren't voluntarily recalling. So this is the government response to that. The recall notice is compulsory and it has to be because there were some who, who weren't voluntarily re, um, recalling. Suppliers and other affected parties, including dealers, second-hand dealers, um, suppliers of spare parts, may all face penalties under the Australian Consumer Law for non-compliance with the recall notice's obligations. Um, let's not shy away from the fact that these penalties can be really significant. For corporations, the maximum penalty per contravention is $1.1 million. So if your corporation, um, if you're a corporation who breached the notice five times, the maximum penalty that you might be exposed to is $5.5 million. But there's a whole range of enforcement um, tools at the HCC's disposal. And so, in addition to pecuniary penalties, you know, a court um, could impose injunctions, um, compensation and non-party redress orders, which involves the payment of compensation to third parties. Um, disqualification orders that might prevent someone from managing a corporation for a specified period. The ACCC also has the power um, to issue infringement notices to companies and people who it has a reasonable basis to believe have failed to comply with the recall notice. And this is as an alternative to taking um, the, the really serious step of taking federal court enforcement action. So the, the, the much, much lower penalty or fine involved. Um, I think it's around 12,600 for a company, around, around two and a half grand per per for a person per contravention. So there's this range of sort of enforcement um, uh, to the, these enforcement tools that the ACCC has to, and, and will be at some point um, using to, to ensure that people comply with the, the recall notice. Which vehicles are most at risk? Um, Takata manufactured a vast range of airbag inflators with differing specifications and designs. Um, which are all affected by the same design defect, which makes them susceptible to this misdeployment. 
which, which Glenn's uh, touched on earlier. In an ideal world, we'd just take all these airbags off the road immediately. Um, however, we all know that there's, um, in fact, a global shortage of replacement parts. And um, I, I suspect people in this room know better than most that there is um, limits to dealer workshop capacity. And this means that it's necessary to prioritise um, vehicles with the most dangerous affected airbag inflators. Um, to do this, the recall notice gives priority to the replacement of alpha airbag inflators. These are known to be affected by um, manufacturing issues, which led to hasten uh, propellant degradation. So basically, there's a, de there, there's a design flaw that affects all, uh, all of these affected Takata airbag inflators. But the alpha inflators also have some manufacturing issues that mean that the problem's worse. And um, there's the, the degradation of the propellant happens more quickly. So they pose um, a really significant and, and much higher risk of causing harm than other affected Takata inflators. Um, for all other affected inflators, the recall notice um, requires suppliers to prioritise replacement of inflators in vehicles located in areas with hot and humid climatic conditions, vehicles that are six years or older, and infl inflators that are located on the um, driver's side. And this is because experts have found that time and temperature cycling um, lead to the explosive material in affected inflators um, becoming unstable um, and the proximity of the driver's side inflator which is you know in the steering wheel um, pointed directly at the driver's head and, and the fact that usually there's a driver in a car when the um, inflator um, is the airbag is deployed uh, make those driver side inflators uh, more likely to kill than, than to injure. Um, there are three categories of supplier under the, the recall notice. Uh, essentially there's um, category A and B suppliers which you can see on the slide there. Uh, they're really the original original equipment manufacturer, the OEM, or the manufacturer. I'll sometimes use the term OEM, I'll sometimes say manufacturer. And then there's the category C supplier, who are um, grey importers of enthusiast type vehicles. Um, the notice is a little more um, flexible towards this type of supplier because um, we acknowledge that some of these businesses just don't have anywhere near the resources of the large OEMs to um, engage in sort of detailed communication. On the, so, so there's a little bit more flexibility there, a bit more leeway. Are there any grey importers here? No. So in that definition of supply that I just gave, um, you might have noticed that it doesn't capture authorised dealers, second-hand dealers, auto recyclers or auction houses, and that's intentional. The recall places the focus on the manufacturers to fix the Takata problem. That doesn't mean that, um, that you as, uh, you know, who are not manufacturers yourselves, don't also have obligations under the notice. And I'm gonna to come to them in more detail a bit later. But what I wanna do for this um, next part of the presentation um, is to spend some time talking through the obligations um, that the recall notice places on the manufacturers so that you can better understand the bigger picture and, and where you fit into that, that, that big, bigger picture. So suppliers or manufacturers um, have direct obligations to recall and replace under the recall notice. Suppliers must also track and report their recall and replacement activity. 
the recall notice recognises that in practice a manufacturer will use its um, authorised dealer network to perform required actions under the recall notice. But the manufacturer must support their dealers to conduct replacements, including by um, covering the costs of replacements and providing detailed instructions about how the recall is to be conducted. Manufacturers must also put in place arrangements whereby a consumer can present their vehicle um, to any dealer in the OEM's network and they must also ensure that their dealers and other authorised representatives comply with the requirements of the recall notice when acting on the manufacturer's behalf. Um, the notice also requires OEMs to um, implement second-hand vehicle action plans um, to ensure the distribution of um, recall information to the second-hand vehicle market and, and encourage and support replacement through their dealer networks. Okay, so, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to explore these requirements as they apply to the manufacturers. Um, we've touched on it already, but it, it's important to understand that particular requirements apply to alpha inflators. As I've noted, alpha inflators pose that extreme risk of rupture um, due to known manufacturing issues at Takata plants in certain periods. Basically, they more moist. While, while um, all affected inflators allow some moist air in, um, because of these known manufacturing issues, these let even more moist air in, and that that, um, that leads to the destabilisation of the propellant. Um, any OEM that has supplied vehicles equipped with alpha inflators was required to commence recalls of those inflators within one week of, of the recall notice commencing, which was back on 3 April. Um, the inflator must be replaced within five days of the part becoming available at the designated dealership, and the OEM has got two weeks to get the part there. The, the manufacturer must also offer to arrange for the vehicle to be towed to a dealership um, or for a qualified technician to travel to the consumer. That's just with the, um, the Alpha airbags. And I think we're making really good progress on getting them off the roads. For any other type of affected Takata airbag inflator, which is the, the majority now that are out there, um, the manufacturers are required to initiate recalls and replace the inflators as soon as practicable. Um, and that's, that's the operative word, as soon as practicable, or term. And that's following the notification that a communication and engagement plan has been approved by the ACCC. Now, um, I'll come to those communication engagement plans later. Uh, but, that, but the manufacturers were required to provide the ACCC with um, a recall initiation schedule, um, again back on 3 April. Um, which appropriately prioritises the recall of their affected vehicles. Um, the manufacturers must also ensure that quarterly completion targets are met in accordance with a quarterly completion schedule. I'm going to talk about both of those things in a moment. Um, finally, unless otherwise approved by the ACCC, the recall is to be completed by 31 December 2020. So what is a recall initiation schedule and what's a quarterly completion schedule? In essence, the recall initiation schedule is the timetable identifying when the supplier will recall affected vehicles. Um, the notice acknowledges that there is a limited supply of replacement parts and that these should be directed to those vehicles that most urgently require replacement. It's um, vitally important that consumers are not deterred in some way from participating in the recall and that the experience um, in overseas jurisdictions where there's been uh, recalls is that if you do anything that makes it difficult for them, they become complacent and they don't, they don't participate. Um, if the vehicle has an alpha inflator, 
then the supplier must offer to arrange for the vehicle to be towed um, to the place of replacement um, or for a qualified technician to travel to the vehicle or some similar arrangement so that the consumer need not drive the vehicle. For those particular types of inflators, and there's not that many left on the road thankfully, it is just it's crucial that consumers do not drive those vehicles if they don't want to. If, if, if for other um, affected inflators, if the replacement process will deprive the consumer of the use of their vehicle for more than 24 hours, um, following the time that the car is taken to the place of replacement, then at the consumer's request, the supplier must provide the consumer with a loan or hire vehicle or find some you know, uh, other acceptable alternative transportation. And that's for the duration of the replacement process. That's a bit of a mouthful, but um, for those, basically, if it's going to take more than 24 hours, then you, you should have arrangements in place um, to provide a loan or high car. Now, I should note here that if a replacement is taking more than 24 hours, um, this is probably a sure sign that the manufacturer has failed to um, appropriately plan its recall initiation schedule. It should not take more, more than a day for this to be done. Um, there's also some other circumstances where, um, where at the consumer's request, the supplier uh, must make alternative um, transportation arrangements available. And there's some examples there on, on, on the um, on the slide, basically if they're elderly, infirm, um, disabled or otherwise have special needs, they're located um, more than 250 uh, k's from the nearest place of replacement or located on an island um, which does not have a dealer in the supplies network. Yep. Um, so suppliers also have to, along with the communication and engagement plans, they also have to um, develop second-hand vehicle action plans. Um, the recall notice is designed to ensure that the manufacturers and their related companies, um, which have supplied affected vehicles into the Australian market, really shoulder the responsibility for the recall. And I think I've made the point, and I'll keep making the point, that the regulatory focus of this notice is, is on those manufacturers. Um, however, the notice acknowledges that the recall activity will be implemented by the dealer networks. And with this in mind, the notice requires the OEMs to support the authorised dealers. Perhaps I should make a point again that neglecting that sector of the market will lead to the suppliers failing to comply with their recall completion targets under the notice. So there's an incentive there for them to help you. Um, if they don't, and they fail to comply with their notice, um, then the HMC will likely come after them. And that's where you see those large penalties coming into play. So um, it's, it's we're sort of creating a situation where there's incentive for parts of industry that have Past work particularly well together um, to start work, to start working together. We thought it was uh, worth just noting that the notice imposes obligations on um, um, on suppliers, dealers, and other authorised agents and suppliers regarding um, the quarantine and destruction of affected to car airbag inflators. Um, it is the supplier's responsibility to provide instructions to all authorised agents in relation to the quarantine, labelling and handling of affected inflators. Um, but I just urge you to take detailed records um, of quarantine and destruction processes under the notice. Um, the actual CMA require production of these records, then you can do that under the notice. But I suppose the more important point to make is that these are really dangerous 
defective goods um, have killed and seriously injured people. Um, so it's really in your interest, uh, and I'm not giving any kind of advice here, legal advice, but it's in your interest to keep records of what you've done with them if you've, if you've had them in possession. <coughs> Finally, I'm coming to the end of the manufacturer's part of the presentation. I should note that the suppliers also have these reporting obligations under the recall notice which are set up here. Um, I've already spoken about the CEPs that came in on, on 3 April. Um, second hand vehicle action plans were submitted from 1 May, considering those. Um, from 1 July, that quarterly completion schedule that I showed before um, um, must be published on the supplies website. And suppliers will then commence monthly reporting on their production rates from 13 July 2019. Um, there's also a requirement that on the um, two business days of becoming aware of a missed deployment, um, the supplier of the vehicle must submit a really detailed report to the agency getting a whole lot of information about the, the missed deployment. So, um, so I hope that so far you've gained a, a, a clearer understanding of how the notice works um, and that you understand that it has been designed to place the focus on the manufacturer. Um, you, you now know, if you didn't know before, um, that those manufacturers who have supplied these affected vehicles are busily consulting with the HMC about a whole range of plans and reports for the HMC's approval. Um, those, those plans that will be developed to, um, to meet the manufacturer's obligations will not work for them if they do not work for you. And as I've said, this is because the notice creates an obligation for the OEMs to account for 100% of affected inflators. And this, I think, probably incentivizes the OEMs as much as anything um, to provide assistance to all, um, to all of the industry. Remember, this is a compulsory recall. The manufacturers ultimately wear the responsibility of complying with the recall and as I've noted, significant penalties and other remedies can apply for contraventions of the notice. But that's not to say that the notice does not impose some obligations on, on you guys. Um, and so in this next part of the presentation, I'm going to talk about those obligations, the dealer and spare parts and buyer obligations under the notice. The notice prohibits the supply of new vehicles with affected to carbon inflators after 31 percent of this year. Before then, um, you may sell new affected vehicles in certain circumstances, and I'll, I'll discuss them in a moment, but never if they are under active recall. If the, if the vehicle is under future recall, then there's certain requirements, certain um, disclosure requirements that I will come to in a moment. Um, so these new vehicles are vehicles with new, brand new inflators in them. So they don't presently pose any risk of Mr. Pullman because the expert um, opinion is that a um, conservative estimate of when that risk commences is six years post manufacture. Any new vehicle that gets out and is supplied at this time, and I'm told that there's um, this supplies to only a few um, manufacturers and there's very um, few vehicles that will, be, will fall within this category, they will all need to be replaced by December 2020. So that's long before they become unsafe. Um, I've already spoken about what active and future recall mean, but I think it's worth just having a bit of a refresher. 
um, active recall means that the supplier has initiated recall action for the vehicle. Um, this will be um, recorded in the online recall database and on the actual C website. Um, suppliers have submitted those recall initiation schedules to the actual C for approval. Once approved, all vehicles on that schedule that are not under active recall now will nevertheless be scheduled for some future recall. And all, of, all vehicles, all affected vehicles, are to be replaced by the end of 2020. The recall notice is designed to provide OEMs with sufficient flexibility to initiate that recall action in accordance with those priority factors that I spoke about. And only when they have sufficient replacement stock to ensure that the replacement can take place quickly and efficiently. Um, unfortunately, the recall simply would not work if all affected vehicles were immediately subject to active recall, as much as we'd like to do that. If a vehicle is under active recall, whether it's new or second hand, you must not sell it. It's that simple. Doing so will breach the SEL and may expose you to enforcement action. Um, now, in the next few slides, I'm going to explain the obligations that apply in relation to the supply of vehicles under future recall. I'm going to take out of the, of that, the slide that's just gone was. Uh, cannot sell a vehicle under active recall. Um, as I noted a few slides ago, under the recall notice, um, it is permissible to sell a new vehicle that is not yet subject to active recall. However, there are really strict notification requirements that apply, um, and they are set out in this slide and include making oral and written disclosures, updating the vehicle um, <coughs> service book and causing um, certain notices to be fixed to the vehicle. Um, these requirements will be covered in each affected manufacturer's communication engagement plan. Um, as I've said, these plans have been submitted to the HLC and under those plans the suppliers will be required to provide dealers with clear instructions about um, the requirements, the notification requirements <coughs> uh, for new vehicles. And I want to say again, there is an extremely limited number of new, ve of new affected vehicles um, that have these, these requirements in them. It's unfortunate that um, there have to be that enough flexibility um, to allow them through. Because there are reasons that, um, that have to be to be structured that way. Also, in terms of the future recall of second-hand vehicles, you may sell a second-hand vehicle that is scheduled for future recall um, without replacement. But again, there are these uh, notification requirements that apply. Um, OEMs are required to develop a second-hand vehicle action plan, as I've said. And they, they need to address these matters um, and communicate them to, to all second-hand dealers. In summary, you will be required to notify a prospective purchaser orally and in writing prior to sale that the vehicle has an affected to cut a bag inflator that will require future replacement. Um, the notification requirements will be different for second-hand vehicles that are more than six years post-manufacture and the messaging will be uh, more urgent for these older vehicles because, as I've said, the expert evidence is that they are at a greater risk of rupture than the older vehicle. At the time of sale, you are required to seek the consent of the purchaser to provide their contact details to the supplier for the purposes of the future recall. This is to ensure that the supplier is able to locate the, the new owner. Now, I've got a question in Perth about this. 
Um, so what if I don't give their consent? And the answer is pretty simple. If I don't give their consent, if you try it, you don't have to do anything further, you've got to hide. As I've said, time and climatic conditions are factors which increase the risk of an affected inflated mist deployment. And this, together with this global shortage <coughs> of um, appropriate replacement inflators, means that sometimes the best option will be for the supplier to replace an older affected airbag with a new affected airbag. This effectively restarts the clock. So if you've got a vehicle that's um, 12 years old and is somewhere in Queensland exposed to this, um, this lovely heat and humidity that you guys get, <laughs> um, if we want, if there's no other replacement part, it's, it's important that it gets a brand new part because that will just start the clock back at zero. Where a vehicle is under active recall uh, um, and is repaired using a, a, what we call a like for like, it's not even clear that they um, cemented the vernacular as a like for like replacement. It's not really a like for like because it's a brand new um, airbag that's replacing an old and very dangerous airbag that we call a like for like. Um, but when that happens, it will be immediately scheduled for future recall again. Um, and that's on the basis of what the manufacturer knows when it will be able to get these new parts in to replace them. So its recall status will move from active to future rather than from active to complete. Um, there are certain obligations that dealers should be aware of in relation to like-for-like -like replacements. <laughs> Again, you must orally and in writing notify the owner of the car that the affected inflator has been used as a replacement and will need replacement again. If the recall initiation schedule is available, um, which they are now, you must inform the owner when the vehicle is scheduled for further recall. Um, or you can direct them to the supplier's website noting that the recall initiation schedule is published there. You must inform the owner that the OEM will directly contact the owner when the recall is initiated um, and you must make a record in the vehicle service book that a uh, life for life replacement has been used. Um, it's a durable notice that must be fixed to the vehicle's windscreen and engine bay containing a statement to the effect that the vehicle has been fitted with a life for life airbag. The reason for these notification requirements is that there are concerns that consumers who are not informed of like for like replacements will incorrectly assume um, that they do not need to participate when they receive notification of a further recall. Um, <coughs> there'll be a whole lot of guidance on these notification requirements and they'll be set out in the, the, the CEP, the Communication Engagement Plan. Which the actual says in the final stages of approving. I wanted to say a word about dealer to dealer or wholesale or supply. Um, the actual city is aware that it's not uncommon for dealers to supply vehicles to other dealers um, or to wholesalers, and on occasion we've been asked by dealers and other industry participants. Does the recall notice apply to these transactions? Um, in fact, we simply are asked that usually at every roadshow that we go to. And look, the answer is yes. Um, this is because the recall notice applies to all suppliers of affected vehicles which occur in trade or commerce, and that covers these business to business type transactions. Um, I've heard some concerns that in the case of vehicles under active recall, um, this may lead to an extensive delay. And I really um, understand that concern because, you know, say you've received 
a trading vehicle that's subject to active recall and you seek to sell that vehicle to a wholesaler in your normal practice. Um, now under this, this written compulsory recall notice, you must first have the effective inflate replaced. The longer it takes you to do this, um, the more the vehicle appreciates, um, the depreciates in, in value. We all know that in this business time is money. Um, this, this safety issue is not your fault. You didn't put these, these things um, in the car. Why is it now your problem? Look, the recall notice provides flexibility to the manufacturers to enable them to plan and implement their recall activity to ensure that they do not initiate an active recall unless they have sufficient capacity to conduct recalls quickly and efficiently. And as I've said, they're incentivized to do it that way. What this all means is that once the OEMs have finalised these recall initiation schedules and the communication engagement plans and second-hand vehicle action plans, we do not anticipate that there will be significant delay involved in placements being conducted for any vehicle that is under active recall. Um, having said that, we are well aware that um, for some this has been a real issue and that that this broader issue is going to cause some um, interruption to the way that you conduct your business. Um, and that's particularly so, I think, in this early stage of the recall, where I think that things will fall into place a bit more as these, these initiatives come um, online. But what we all need to keep in mind here is that this is really an unprecedented global safety issue. Um, and of the most serious kind, the kind that causes death and very serious injury. So there's there's no elegant solution to that problem. Um, what we've had to do is be deliberate to ensure that the manufacturers shoulder most of the regulatory burden. But there's going to be some you're going to pop some flack off the side. If you experience really extensive to, delays for replacements, you tell us, get in touch with the HLC. Um, we want to know if suppliers are failing to properly um, implement the recall the way it was designed to be implemented and the HLC will take action if, if we hear reports of, of extensive delay. Under the recall notice, uh, a spare part supplier must not supply an effective Takata airbag inflator. Um, there's some obligations on spare part suppliers. Um, and they include to use your best endeavours to identify whether any parts um, in your possession are or contain an effective Takata airbag inflator. And best, best endeavours is not a particularly onerous, onerous standard um, under this recall notice. It's just um, work out with, you know, run these things through the recall database, work out whether you've got any on the lot. Um, and then contact, so you do that, you identify whether you've got any, then you are also required to contact the relevant manufacturer. Um, to arrange for the affected spare part to be safely retrieved. Um, once you've done that, you're discharged of any obligation under the notice. And it then falls to the manufacturer to arrange for the retrieval of the airbag at its own cost. Um, I, I want to st stress the point that we expect that as a result of some of these second engagement plan initiatives, we're going to see a far greater level of engagement between the manufacturers and the auto recycling sector than there has been in the past. You know, there hasn't been a great level of um, engagement in the past. Um, 
Um, I don't think there are any auction houses here, but I'm going to, for the record, um, just address that um, industry sector. Um, there are a number of ways in which an auction house may be involved in the supply of an affected vehicle. Um, first, it may be that the auction house owns the affected vehicle and sells it by way of auction. Um, in those circumstances, the auction house is a supplier and, uh, and will be the subject um, of the recall notice. Um, so all those, all those obligations relating to vehicles under active recall, the prohibition on the supply of vehicles under active recall, the notification obligations in relation to vehicles under future recall, they apply to the auction house. The situation also arises in the sort of second way that they some, sometimes supply, and this is when they do it on, on behalf of another, another person. <coughs> In those circumstances, the auction house doesn't necessarily attract the primary obligations under the recall notice, um, but it's possible um, that the auction house is nevertheless going to be liable as an accessory to, um, to a contravention. You know, if it's aware that the vehicle is subject to, to recall, it doesn't apply. Um, so, our um, what we we say it's best practice is to just, um, if you're an auction house, is to uh, deal with all, all vehicles um, that are affected as if the notice applies to you. And I've been really encouraged as we've gone around the country and spoken with some of the auction houses that that's exactly what they're doing. Okay, we're getting towards the end of the presentation. I just wanted to talk through some Australian consumer law issues um, and then we'll take questions. Um, first, it's important to note um, that if you conduct business and trade or commerce in this country, you have probably heard of the ACL and you should be aware that you have obligations under it. The recall notice was issued pursuant to the ACL. Um, it does not change the obligations which you have under the ACL. In fact, it makes very clear that the obligations of the ACL continue to apply. And that's the first operative provision in the, the recall notice says that the ACL continues to apply. Um, slide slide. Under the ACL, all goods and services purchased by consumers are covered by statutory consumer guarantees. I'm sure that many, many of you will be familiar with these, but these include guarantees that the goods are of acceptable quality, the goods are fit for purpose, and repairs and spare parts for the goods are reasonably available. Um, you need to be aware that these provisions and all other obligations under the ACL continue to apply to you. Um, while the recall notice is designed to ensure that the regulatory burden of the recall is carried by the OEMs, the ACL has a much broader application and applies to all dealers and spare parts suppliers. Um, and you know, I guess some guidance on, on the ACL on the HMC's website. I think that every we have four or so presentations around the country, we are always asked um, uh, why does the recall notice place all these obligations on suppliers, authorised dealers, second hand dealers, and wholesalers? <coughs> Um, and do nothing to stop private sales of affected vehicles. Um, the answer to that is that um, the ACL provides the Minister with power to regulate transactions and trade or commerce. This power does not extend to consumers who privately sell their cars 
to other humans. And this is the, the challenge that we face. We can only act within the confines of the law. Um, but we, we share your concerns, and if we, if we had the power, we, I'm pretty sure we'd be using it. Um, we don't want to see someone killed or injured after privately purchasing an effective vehicle from another consumer. We think that the best way to respond to this challenge is to raise awareness about the safety issue so that purchasers are reluctant to buy vehicles subject to recall and to ensure that owners of affected vehicles participate in the recall before they sell their cars. Informed consumers will not want to purchase a vehicle fitted with an affected car airbag inflator. And it won't matter to an informed consumer whether the vehicle is offered for sale by a dealer or another consumer, because it's their safety that's at risk. Um, there can be no doubt that the recall notice has already increased consumer awareness about the problem. And as the communication and engagement um, initiatives that I've been speaking about um, come online, um, we're going to see further, a further increase in awareness I should note that carsales.com and other um, popular online marketplaces are already sending alerts to private sellers who have posted affected vehicles online. And so there's a lot of voluntary, and while we can't force, um, we, we can't force these notification requirements on private sellers, we're seeing that it's happening voluntarily through the domain marketplace, online marketplace. Um, the other way of responding to this challenge um, posed by the, the private sale of affected vehicles is for the agency to engage with the states and territories about this current <coughs> problem. And that's exactly what Glenn and his team have been doing. Um, so the HFC is exploring the possibility of the state and territory registration authorities, um, you know, cancelling and withholding registration of vehicles where a consumer has received numerous communications informing them that their vehicle is under active recall and has failed to participate in that recall. Um, and at this stage, they're sort of focusing on the alpha. But, you know, the actual state doesn't have power to sort of force any of this, it's all about um, diplomacy at this point. Um, in terms of uh, next steps, the HLC is assessing uh, those second-hand vehicle action plans against the requirements in the recall notice, the communication engagement plans as well. Um, HLC is continuing to update frequently asked questions to address emerging issues. And, um, there's a lot of information on the HLC's website. The, the problem with that is sometimes there's too much information. Um, so what we're doing um, is going out in third dot point, consulting with industry and consumers about the recall requirements and um, monitor, and then we're going to move to monitoring the recall action and overseeing compliance.